Welcome back to Masters of the Nerdiverse, where we always have such sites to show you. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and YouTube. I'm very happy to be back. Of course, this is your host, Mike G. And also back is my co-host. Again, for the second time, Bradley. Bradley, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh... How's how's everything going for you? How's your week been so far? How how are you doing? Like how's everything? How's life? Um, like I said last week, I was happy to get through with that Conor McGregor nonsense. I think the world is at this point. Uh yep. And uh, now that that's over, um, things are looking good. But you know, my week was kind of like a blur. It was one of those situations where you just go to work. You come home and go to sleep. You Straight get up. up, go back to work. The rat race, man. Absolutely. Uh, do, how did you uh, like the fight? Did you watch it? Yeah, I watched it. Man, did you go to like a big like house party, or did you just you know stream it off off the internet at the house? Or it Actually, good? it was a mutual friend of ours' baby shower. Oh, it happened okay. to be his friend's birthday. Oh, that's... so um, they had the fight at. Uh, at a mutual friend of ours' house, and um, along with the baby shower. That's cool. That kind of, you know, two birds with one stone kind of thing. Yep. And you got to get some free food and free fight, right? Yep. That's what's well, up. Well, not man. necessarily free. You know, I had to I had to bear uh, uh, gifts. For the shower. Child, huh? I had to shower the child with gifts. So mm-hmm. the Literal shower, right? Absolutely. Yeah, man. The fight was all right. It was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like a total shit show. I mean, it kind of was, but at least it went 10 rounds. Yeah. Well, to the untrained eye, it went 10 rounds, but to the boxing enthusiast, it went three and a half rounds. So you said um, uh, Connor was already uh, counting his money from three, to se- from three to 10? To be honest with you, the, the fight was over when he signed the contract, but you can literally see it in the first round because the Floyd, first thing Floyd Mayweather did, which is very uncharacteristic, was ball up and go to the ropes. And let Conor McGregor punch himself out. So at the end of the first round, I saw him punched out. Mm-hmm. Uh, second round, he punched himself out some more. Third round, he was he was done. By the end of the fourth round, you could see him huffing and puffing, gassing for air. Yeah, he was gassed out. But you know, it was to be expected. Dude never fought an actual boxing match before in his life. So what did you expect, right? Yeah. Now, a random question before I go into my week. Do you expect Floyd to get into the octagon? Do you think they'll flip it and make it fair? Do you think he will set himself up to be in that situation? Um, no, because Conor McGregor and anybody in MMA typically make five million and below. Right. They don't make the astronomical figures that <laughs> Floyd Mayweather does in boxing. Right. So, um, Fair or not fair, it's absolutely stupid for him to get in the ring like it was stupid for Conor McGregor to get in that ring. It was very stupid for Conor. It, it was stupid for him in terms of you know thinking he could win the fight, but it was very smart in terms of making that money because he would have to probably fight uh, at least 12 to 20 MMA fights to make that much money he made in that one. And he's not going to do that. Man. He's already retired, quote unquote, so he's not going to. He's not going to put in that kind. He, he doesn't want to work that hard for that much money. You know what I'm saying? If I, I was, so. he was it, under under Dana White. He's making any MMA fighter makes five million and below. Mm-hmm. So Conor McGregor is flirting around the five million dollar uh, uh, range for a fight. You just came in the one fight and made over a hundred million dollars with Floyd. It would be stupid for him to get back in the octagon. And, and try to negotiate another five million dollar fight. Yeah, that's pittance. That's that's a percentage. Right. Now, as I don't, I would, this is a nerd podcast, but this is kind of fascinating to me. So, where does Connor go from here? Like, like you said, he's normally paid about five, six million a fight during his normal UFC runs with Dana White, right? Mm-hmm. He just got a uh, hundred times multiplier, pretty much, for one fight. One a highly high profile fight, but one fight nonetheless. Would he be satisfied going back to his five million dollar pittance, or he's is he going to try to stay at that level of of of, of, of lucrative kind of you know all my nerds, promotion? I don't know? mean to cut you up, but all my nerds out there, you know, um, I want y'all to see the uh, post fight press conference with Conor McGregor when he's in the locker room 
and when he's uh, at the podium. Right. Don't don't worry about what he's saying. Notice what's in his hand. He has whiskey, and when he's at the uh, when he's at the, uh, the the podium, they ask him a very serious question. He takes a, a, a shot of the whiskey, and he goes, "Whoa, that whiskey's good! Look out for me, everybody! I'm taking over the Irish whiskey game." So, so that's that's, that's what it. you're gonna look out. He's making whiskey now. And I, I would recommend he make whiskey. He's going to make a lot of money. He's going to he, make a lot of he money. He can make a lot of money with doing it. anything. So. so, you know what? And to close this out, this just reminds me of The Great White Hype. You know, remember that movie with, uh, with Damon Wayans and Jeff Goldblum? Yeah. So, it's like silly, like um, life entertaining art. You know what I mean? But Absolutely. I guess that's what boxing has been since uh, Ali Frazier, right? So... No, that's what that's what uh, mainstream prize fight boxing is. It's, and this was a prize fight, man. This no, was, this is a mainstream uh, uh, fight. Yeah. Was, speaking of fighting, I'm just gonna go into. Well, how was your week? Oh, very. Thank you. You kind of. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested. The words out of my mouth there. <clears throat> so um, let's definitely get into the weeks. Sound effects. I'm probably going to have it. I said I was going to have a different one last time. I didn't. I'm a liar, a cheat, and a thief. I've stolen your time. But this time, I will make sure I have a new sound effect. That's going to be strange, but also awesome. Like a juggling bear. I don't know. So I'm speaking of uh, juggling, I was juggling my wins and losses in Injustice this week. Uh, took it online, which I usually don't do, because online is like, it's a it's a mismatch. It's like it's you get really good playing online because you don't you you can't ever slouch in a fight because you don't know who you're coming across because numbers lie. Like you can play against someone who's a rank one, but has played the game for two hundred hours. You're just like a person like me who's put in a lot of time but not really a lot of online reps. Or you can play someone who's a glass cannon and they've only and they have like a crazy win ratio, maybe like a, a seventy five you know, percent win rate. So I played a bit online. I took my Green Lantern online, and it was pretty all right. I got, I was a little, I got a little uh, cold feet at first because I was just I hate playing online, especially when it's lag. Online gaming, that's the one thing I don't think is ever going to be 100%. It's just online gaming based on people's locations and stuff. But with, with Internet 2.0 coming out, we'll, never, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh... Besides um, playing some Injustice, didn't really play any other video games this week. I played a little Outlast 2. Have you heard of that game? It's a horror game. Uh, uh, Outlast yes. series? Yes, I absolutely have. Yeah. Um, I bought Outlast 2 maybe like three months ago. And I just, I booted it up. I was just like, nah. And I turned it off and played, uh, I think I was playing uh, my Horizon at the time. So over the weekend, I was like, I'm just going to fire this up and play it a bit more. Um, it's a pretty good um, horror game, very atmospheric. It was very cheap at the time, too. It was like $30, so I definitely recommend picking it up. It's no PT, but, you know, what is... Uh, have you ever heard of that? You know what PT is, Bradley? Have you ever heard of that? The whole story behind that? No. Okay, I'm going to give you the rough breakdown really quick. So, there is this, um, there's this game developer named Hideo Kojima. Have you heard of him with Metal Gear Solid and all that, right? Vaguely. Vaguely. Okay, Metal, he's a, he's a creator of Metal Gear. He's kind of like the Willy Wonka of game developers right now. He's like really good, but very weird, right? So he's been working with this company called Konami. Konami's made Castlevania. Right. Uh, Silent Hill. You know what I mean? Uh, Metal Gear Solid, right? And so, okay, H- Hideo Kojima was going to co- produce and co-write a horror game with Guillermo del Toro who's the director of Hellboy right. uh, Pan's Labyrinth and my favorite uh, The Devil's Backbone and they made this playable trailer this is what PT is and it was free and they didn't give any explanation of what the game was they just threw it out into the PlayStation store and let people discover it and it's by far the scariest game of all time Like it's very simplistic what is the name? P- PT. It's called the Playable Trailer. Uh, don't go looking for it, unfortunately, because the end of the story is is that Hideo Kojima had a huge fallout with Konami, and 
they pretty much scorched earth the entire game. They st- and what PT was was going to be the precursor to Silent Hills, a brand new Silent Hill game created by horror legend um, Guillermo, del Toro. Guillermo del Toro and video game legend Hideo Kojima, peanut butter and chocolate coming together, making possibly the best horror game of all time. And if PT was any kind of indication to that, it would it would have been insane. So um, just, PT is pretty much the best thing ever if you, well, if you can get it, and it's extremely hard to get. Okay, now. who fell out with who? Um, Hideo Kojima, the director of Metal Gear Solid, fell out with his primary company, his parent company, Konami, the game developer, and they pulled the plug on all of his projects, Metal Gear okay. and this new one. But he can still he can still make the game he wants with. Guillermo del Toro. That's the thing is that he can't make Silent Hills because that's a property that's owned by Konami. So he can't make that, right? He doesn't own Silent Hills. Well, yeah, yeah, I got does. you. But it doesn't have to be Silent Hill. He could just make something. He can make Quiet, you know, Quiet House, right? You know, so, or a derivative. But Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro has is kind of salt, salty about the whole situation. Like he he's tried to make video games in the past and they've all failed. Mm-hmm. All on the corporate level, they failed. Not not like production issues or the game was bad. Just it didn't get off the ground because of big corporate um, corporate uh, video game. Mm-hmm. Exactly corporate blunders. So he's like, I'm never going to try to make video games again. I'm over it. And Hodel's like, Well, I'm here if you want to make video games ever again. And you know, Guillermo's you know being all kind of sad about it. Which makes PT actually a tragedy because for what it is, it's terrifying and great. But I digress. Um, if you can, if you, if you know anyone who has a copy of PT, play it. I have a, a, a saved copy on my PS4, and I'm never deleting that thing because once you delete it, it's over. You can never get it back again. You can't download it, even if you have already downloaded it from the PlayStation Store. Okay, so that's crazy, right? Like you can't. You have to hack it to get it. So okay. But when he fell out, the game is no longer available. The people that downloaded it can still play it? Yes, because it's because the game itself does not have an online connection. So it's pretty much locked on their hard drive. Ah, I got you. You know, so th- there's no way for them to go on the back end and piggyback and, and pretty much um, blue ring the game, right? Or, or blue screen the game, the game. So if you have it, you can play it and you're good. But if you lose it, it's... It's pretty much you have to go on the dark web to find another copy of it. How would you lose it? Um, um, your memory can get corrupted. Uh, uh, someone unplugged the the lights go out while you're saving. You know, video games are sensitive. Your your kid brother pours Kool Aid on the PS4. You know. Okay, so basically breaking your system, breaking your system, or corrupting your data can lose that game. Your data can be corrupted without your system being broken? Yes, because it can be an update that, that um, corrupts your data. It could be um, it, turning off the game uh, while it's loading. Can, and that's that goes back to old PlayStation games. You know? What are steps that individuals should take to keep their systems in working condition at all times? Oh, okay. We can go there. Uh, working condition of all times. The big three, I would say, is temperature, uh Keeping it, keeping the dust out of it, and and just not beating it with a stick. You know what I mean. Uh, one, you definitely want to keep it at a cool temperature because it can overheat. Games, game systems overheat. There's actually off-market cooling systems that you can plug into your game to keep it cool. Another and pro tip: don't use candles around video game systems because the smoke that comes off a candle is a lot heavier and it can actually cause your game to overheat if it's in the same room. So pro tip, don't burn candles if you're playing the PS4. It's overheated my PS4 three times. I don't know what was going on. I opened it and cleaned it from the inside out. I dusted it and everything. Read a little bit online. Candles. Don't burn candles, guys. And lastly, just don't don't be rough on it. You know, it's like reminds me when I was a kid. I was that kid who always kept his games in alphabetical order and super clean and all that. And when I see people just like leaving their games just spread out all over the floor and no boxes is just it's a, a nerd tick in my brain. So right. treat it right and you'll be fine. All right. Got that. You hear that, nerds? Take notes. Take notes. Relax and take notes. Uh, wrap up the rest of my week. I watched uh, Death Note. Have you seen that on, on Netflix? Death Note. Death Note is based off the popular Japanese animes. It's a live-action American adaptation. 
So this is a bit of a funny story. I've never seen Death Note, but people are going to be like, "You've never seen Death Note?" You know, give me, give me, give me bullshit. But I've never watched it. This is one of those that never flew on my periphery. I'm a big anime fan. Never watched Death Note, so I figured this is the best time to watch the adaptation because usually you're jaded if you see the original. It's like you can't live up to the to the anime and all that nonsense that fanboys go through. Right. right? Absolutely. So I'm like, okay, let me watch this movie. And see if I even dig it. So I watched the movie. And the movie's a 7. It's a solid 7. It's not great. And it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. And when it comes to video game adaptations. Uh, Death Note. Death Note. And you give it a 7. 7. Okay. And, I, and people say I have strange taste in movies. You I, do? I very, I very much do. And uh, it has Willem Dafoe playing the titular Rook. Which is the demon. So for those who don't know what Death Note's about. I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of what Death Note is. So the Death Note is a book that falls out the sky and is given to a protagonist. Um, this protagonist then has the option to, uh, in the book, it gives you the chance if you write someone's name in the book, they will, they will automatically die by natural causes, no matter what. You have to visualize the person's face and write their name in the book. And you can even write the way that you want them to die, and the Death Note will fill out that wish, and that person will die. It's extremely overpowered, you know, kind of device there. And there's certain rules you have to follow to do it, but for the most part, you're pretty much playing God. And the whole anime is about this character's transformation from a normal person to pretty much thinking he is a god on Earth with this crazy, unwieldable power. And it's a cat and mouse game between him and the media, and it's a bunch of stuff. So just... My rudimentary idea of Death Note. So, after I watched the movie, I was kind of in a pickle. I was like, I need to watch the anime now. I, I need to see why people are so upset because the movie wasn't that bad. Like, why are people going nuts? So, I watched five episodes of the anime directly after the movie as a kind of a palate cleanser. And honestly, I think the main character in the movie makes more sense than he does in the anime. You know? And my and people want to say, well, what is your justification for that? Is that the movie felt like more of a gradual transition of the hero slash villain than in the anime, where he's already kind of crazy and he just happens to get this power. But I would definitely recommend checking out Death Note. Um, if something that you just if have something on TV and don't make don't go into it thinking it's more than it is, um, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, close out my week. I just. I finally got my Masters of the Nerdiverse shirt in the mail. Extremely happy about that. So I plan on ordering a bunch of more of those. Got to self-advertise. Got to, you got to advertise. That's that's a big thing. And I just watched a bunch of Burn Notice. You ever watched that show? It's like, no. Oh, uh, that's a negative. That's a negative. I love Burn Notice, man. That is my shiz night. <clears throat> um, besides the fight, anything else going on in your week, Brad? Anything that you want to... Anything that comes to mind for you um not really no. i did a lot of reading as normally yeah i do on those uh lovely weekends when others are out having fun uh but uh i finished a couple game of thrones oh speaking of which did you watch the uh the finale are you are you keeping up with that yeah i watched it what you think i didn't watch it because i'm not really into game of thrones i'm just oh, curious about your hot take it's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, because it's not. It's because it's not close to the book, or is it just terrible well, based on its merits? It can't be close to the book because the show has surpassed the book. Right so now, they're not drawing inspiration from the creator. They have the HBO writers winging it. That's kind of. That's kind of. Hmm. I don't know how to feel about that. I mean, that, it sounds terrible. It though. sounds like a terrible idea. It's like you can't wait. I mean. You put yourself in a bad spot when you're overlapping source material. Yeah. Don't you just stop? But see, <laughs> the book, the books, each book is a 900 page behemoth. Oh, and to wait for George R. R. Martin to write the next book, you're gonna be I waiting. mean, there are two seasons past the book. The next book, each book is a season. So there's six books. They're on season, they just p- finished season seven, and they're delaying season eight because. For, for reasons unknown, but what happened is these these writers 
every the, the backlash from the fans are terrible, and the writers don't like the uh, uh, well, not the writers. The fans don't like the material, so they delayed the next season to like summer of two thousand nineteen. Yeah, summer two thousand nineteen. I saw that. That's nuts. Yeah, and so each episode is supposed to be like two hours long or something crazy, like right. That. Six episodes each. So I know. what they're trying to do is, I think they're trying to wait for some George R. R. Martin material because the writers just mm-hmm. stink. For probably I don't know, or they just don't well, have the writers alive. It's not like it's not like a J.R.R. Tolkien situation where it's like where do we? Like, but the Hobbit, you know what I mean? They they added to the Hobbit outside of J. Or outside of um, Tolkien's ideals. You know, they kind of winged it, as as you say. In, in, in what? Lord in, of the Rings? In the, the Hobbit films. The Lord of the Master of the Two, the Four Armies and all that nonsense. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. The, they, because the, the book is short. The the Hobbit itself is a short, a short right. compared to Lord of the Rings trilogy. Is, so, is the Lord of the Rings an actual book? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a Battle tournament. of the Five Armies is the book? No. That's what they, that's what the studios created. Dude, what about the, t- the, tw- the Two Towers? That's a book. But, oh, so Tolkien didn't make the last Tolkien. Tolkien made the the the, the three movies. Oh, they're not the movies. The three books, mm-hmm. which was this, the solid the trilogy, Hobbit. the Hobbit, and in the Hobbit, right? He didn't okay. make what they added on to the end of the <coughs> Hobbit. They the Lord made. of the Rings is Fellowship of the Ring, correct? The Two Towers, the Two Towers, and uh, Return of the King. Oh, I'm getting them confused. Mm-hmm. And then this Hobbit joint is the Hobbit. It's an offshoot. It's like a Gaiden. So they just the Tolkien only made the Hobbit. Those yes. other two joints were add-ons. Mm-hmm. Got it. Makes so it, there was three Hobbit movies, if I remember correctly, right? Yes. So those other three were like real. They really stretched the uh, the idea. The idea and tried to connect it with Lord of the Rings. Right to the point where. You know, it was really that that great. That was good. Good weeks. Good weeks. So, at this point in the podcast, we're going to go into the news. Alrighty. So, I will be introducing the news from henceforth. And the first thing we're going to cover today is the Secret of Mana remake. Secret of Mana remake. Yep. Announced the remake for of Secret of Mana. PS4. Uh, Vita and Steam, which is excellent. So, for those you don't who don't know, the Secret of Mana was one of those uh, excellent uh, RPGs that was released in 1993 for yeah. the Super Nintendo. It was also released. you had that game. I absolutely, remember. yeah, absolutely. when I was a kid. Um, basically, what it is, it's similar to the Legend of Zelda, but it has a local multiplayer mode. Where on one screen, in a, in a Legend of Zelda fashion, three to four players uh, can play at the same time and yeah. go through these missions. They also have a vast, there's different characters you can pick mm-hmm. and, and build up and kind of, uh, you know, name them, uh, whatever you want to name them. Whatever you want to name them, right? Yeah, yeah. so it's a... You know what? I wasn't really one of those uh, fantasy RPG guys until I played this game, and I was mm-hmm. pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I even looked at uh, some of these uh, uh, clips that were real good, man. They looked pretty good. So you saw the um, you saw the gameplay footage of what it was. Are you hyped for this game? Would you get it if it was on PC? You know what? I will get it for Steam. Yeah, because it is. It says it's, it's here on Steam. What do you think about the Secret of Mana? I, you know, growing up, like like you said, you had it as a kid, or like I mentioned, you had it as a kid, and I remember seeing it because uh, my history with it is I never played it. Honestly, I never played it because it was like a game you would play. We would kind of watch you play, you know, back when we were kids. And uh, I'm really excited that they're bringing this game back and remaster. Not it's not a remaster; it's a remake. Which is actually excellent because they're building it from the floor up. They're not just going over old sprites or anything like that, right? So I'm kind of curious to see the approach on how they do it if they're going to try to modernize the the, the the system. You know what I mean? Because some of these systems are so antiquated that it's hard for new age gamers to wrap their brains around them. Which is why they're doing the same thing to the final, same thing to the Final Fantasy VII remake. 
Well, you know what? It's Secret of Mana was similar to a Minecraft and how you mm-hmm. you can push pause and go into the uh, menu and put on different suits and right. and things like that. Different so it was real simple. And, like stat boost and stuff like that, right? right? But what I'm seeing right here, they said that um, uh, before on the game, everything was text. Yeah. And you had to read the conversations. Right. Now it's it's fully uh, uh, voiced. Voiced, yo. Yeah. So get get in there. Yeah, it's reading and it's voice. Okay, I have a question. Are you gonna get the Japanese dub? Or are you gonna get the American uh, dub? Uh, I'm gonna get the American dub. Yeah. Unfortunately, or English dub for that matter. Yeah, English dub. Um, it looks like in Japan they have a super ultimate edition for the PS4 with all these fancy smancy books and yeah and illustration and books and toys giblets and, and what and, and uh, soundtracks and all that right I'm only, I'm only a sucker for some of those like i very rarely buy those usually i go digital i'm like i don't well i go digital for fighting games and i buy the physical copies of adventure games that's right. how i go about it well, look out for it because it's set to release here in North America in February 15th of 2018. So that's February is like Capcom time. But uh, I'll keep an eye out for it because I'm definitely down to play a good RPG. You know, The Secret of Man is one of those legendary ones like uh, Final Fantasy and Chrono Trigger. You know what I mean? It's it's amongst the, the, that pantheon. You know what I'm saying? Right. Absolutely. Right. All right. In other news... Uh, I don't know if you guys know Ed Skirin. I don't know if I'm saying Screen? His... Screen? Screen the Dream, duh. You don't know him? Right, but whatever. He Francis his... from Deadpool. Francis from Deadpool. There you go. <clears throat> um, what's happening is he's dropping out of the Hellboy uh, uh, new shooting. They're rebooting after a casting uh, controversy. Right. So he was going to play a character uh, called Major Ben Dimino. Domino, you know, like oh, Domino. Yeah, you know what I'm ah, saying. Okay, so he's gonna play Major Ben Domino, and Domino is supposed to be a rugged military member uh, of the Bureau of Paranoia Research and, and development. He's, yeah, 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 of development, and he can turn into a jaguar because of a curse. Uh, the reason why he was um, that that this is gonna be uh, uh, that he left uh, on his own accord, right? Or at least that's what he says, is because. The character is of Japanese descent, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of the fans start kicking up dust because they say that um, this is another one of Hollywood's attempt to whitewash another uh, another character. Right now, uh, Ed has a quote here. Okay. Um, well, actually, Do you want to read this whole thing? I don't want to read this whole. So, quote. pretty much, the cliff notes is um, the big one that I've seen everywhere is. Representation of an ethnic diversity is important, especially to me as I am of mixed heritage family, which I can understand. I, I see it as a classy move. And plus, he don't want that kind of heat, right? You know what no. I'm saying? So, I mean, if it's because he's, he's going to get roles because, you know what I'm saying? He, he was pretty good in, in uh, Deadpool and obviously people want to hire him. But I think this is a way to show Hollywood that you have to respect these characters and respect uh, representation. You know what I mean? And right. representation matters, and no matter yeah. what, you know what I'm saying. That's so. like getting, uh, you know, Tom Cruise to play Bruce Lee in the movie. You know, it's kind of it's not cool. I mean, especially if that is a defining factor of that character's uh, character's arc. You know what I'm saying? If the right. character is a proud African American and that's part of their arc, and you put someone of another race in that role, that kind of demeans that the arc of that character in a way, right? Right. It, well, it doesn't even work. It's not. It's not translatable because the mm-hmm. characters, a lot of a lot of the characters being conversation, the things that they do is going to be based on that element. And, right. And when you have another person in there, that's they, like having you know Mel Gibson as Luke Cage. You know, like what? Yeah. It just doesn't. <laughs> this doesn't, this doesn't sit well. It doesn't work. But good. Good on him. He stuck to his guns in Hollywood, and the fans are going to appreciate him for whatever else he does. All right. Well, I guess you. I hope you guys can appreciate this now. In Gotham, a new hero is born. So <laughs> talk in about this. Four, <laughs> Have you seen this? No, I haven't. Oh my god! You gotta I, post I've, the seen, I've seen. I've seen. The, I've seen this. this Did you see the picture? This picture of his face in the mask. Now, <laughs> I, I've read so Go- Gotham Year One, and it was amazing. <laughs> 
because Bruce yeah. Wayne had yeah. a trench coat and a skull cap, and he was out there uh, putting in work in Gotham Year One. Right, that now, was a good book. I mean, Batman with Year One. Is what you're oh, talking about. yeah, yeah, the Batman Year One. Yeah. Now this right here, this right Gotham, here, Gotham, Gotham, the, the season four, the city that the, the hero that Gotham deserves. So what what's gonna happen in this one? I guess is that yeah, look at his face, dude. Uh, uh, <laughs> This is supposed to be Batman. Can can you take this over? Because I don't even want to touch on it. No, I just I put this in the news because I wanted to laugh at it. I haven't so, watched one episode. Of I have, I've watched three episodes of Gotham because I gave everything the three episode rule. Especially if it's a superhero property, everything gets the three episode rule. I will watch you no matter what you are talking about for three episodes. Three episodes of pure hot garbage. Couldn't do it. Couldn't okay. sit through it. I got a question. Is yes. it worse than? Uh, the Avengers. Does this look worse than the Avengers? This guy's face. Look at his face. Yeah. Okay. Look at his face. I, Is this know, worse than I anything? Know. But he just got there, right? No, he's 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 an existing character. That when Gotham starts, he's like ten years old, right? When the first, Gotham season one starts is right after Bruce's parents get killed. That's where it starts, and you start to see the path of him becoming the Batman. And this is the next evolution of this character. This oh, this picture. This face. I don't. Don't take it off the screen. <laughs> let's, let's move on to other news. Okay, I just I just need to talk oh, about that hot yeah, garbage. Man. That was terrible. Hot. Oh man! All right. So in other news, Toby Hopper, Toby Hooper, man, Hooper of the Texas Chainsaw, Chainsaw Massacre yeah. fame has passed. Honor this good man. Right. I know Mike has probably shed more than his fair share of tears. For this, this guy. Movie. This guy. Helped the horror. Uh, and I really brought this up because one, I want to honor the man because a, man, a human being is passed on Earth, and I think that requires some di- some form of uh, of a discussion. And just my experience with Toby Hooper was started with Poltergeist as a kid, and Poltergeist was one of those films that you really shouldn't have been watching at a very young age, and it just kind of broke my brain that entire movie, and. Uh, it's one of those things where I didn't really get into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre until I was a, a man. I was an adult before I watched that. And just kind of uh, watched it from a film, a, a filmmaker's point of view. It's, it's not scary, right? With the Chainsaw Massacre, it's a dude in a leather suit who makes, in a leather mask who makes pig noises and swings a, a, a chainsaw across Texas in broad daylight. It's a weird movie. If but, I'm not mistaken, that genre is called torture porn, right? Well, this is before. It's not really torture porn. What's funny about the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is there's that there's very little blood in that movie. It's kind of like um, Hitchcock Psycho, where it's all subjective, and there's very little blood in that film. So it's, I wouldn't put it in the same realm of torture porn. Uh, that's more like hostile and and freaking uh, a lot of uh, Eli Roth stuff. But he's more of in 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 its skin. Texas Chainsaw is more of a suspense thriller than it is just a flat-out gory horror movie because the gore is very minimum. It's all really implied implied pain and sound effects and lighting. And then, you know, and then when you go into Poltergeist, it's one of the best horror films of all time. Top top 10, easy, right, okay. on anybody's list. It's just because of the impact it had on film and how do you approach the Haunted Mansion um, trope that has been done to death over and over since the beginning of time, right? How do you refresh that? Well, I know this is going to be very hard on all of our horror movie fans because another horror movie guy passed not too long before that, right? Mm-hmm. It was um, George A. Romero, right. um, the director of uh, uh, Nightmare, uh, Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, right. He's another two horror icons passed within like the last three months. Uh, so it's kind of rough right now, you know what I mean? It just makes you reflect a lot. And one thing I love about horror, what makes me love the ho- love about horror is the social commentary behind these horror films. You know what I mean? Horror really depicts the social anxieties of the culture at the time it's made. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of, after 9-11, a lot of films got more, don't don't leave America. You know, you know Hostel was made directly after 9-11. You know, stay within, you know, stay here, you know, like. All the the Son of Sam murders actually back in the day in the seventies, and the Zodiac Killer was the birth of a slasher film. The normal guy who can just show up to your house and anything could happen. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, um, 
the birth of the Universal Monsters came about from from people becoming in, immig- um, migrating, um, becoming immigrants to America and telling their old stories, their old ghost stories from their old towns. You know what I mean? The Dracula was a story that they told, um, you know, back back in Transylvania, the actual, uh, you know, country, and they, you know, these these campfire stories that become you know, the basis of these films and it kind of is very telling. And I think that's just my little love uh, okay. for horror. That's interesting. You know, and, you know, when I was going to art school, I took a class on horror, you know, on horror, horror you know, horror analysis. And it just made me really open my head to what these guys are really thinking about and what they're trying to say in these tales of terror. That's All right. Horror. Well, tell me what this is trying to say. Yeah. This girl, Anna Dopp. Dopp. Has, yep. Yep. Anna Dot has been cast as Starfire in the Teen Titans live action series. Hmm. Now, first, mm-hmm. this is a two part question. Yeah. First, I want you to tell me what do you think about Anna Dot because it looks like she's a part of 24, 24 Legacy. Legacy. I'm not familiar with her. And the second part uh, is, you know, Anna Dot as Starfire. What do you think is Anna Dot as Starfire? That's the first part. And the okay. second part is. What do you think about a Teen Titans live action live series? Live action series. Oh, okay, let me answer the first question. Anna Dopp cast as Starfire. I'm not very familiar with the actress. Uh, she's pretty. You got to in Starfire is pretty. You know what I mean? She's it's very obvious. She's a woman of color, but so is Starfire. She's orange, so it kind of balances out. Uh, I have to see. It's one of those things where I don't know a lot about the actress, so I don't want to make a gut decision and say, "Oh, this is gonna be garbage." But no, she. Uh, we'll see. I mean. Especially with people I'm not familiar with, I don't know her work, but I know Starfire. Starfire is a very Starfire is a very spunky kind of fish out of water character, and if she can convey that, that'll be great. And and how, what do I think of a Teen Titans live action series? Uh, it kind of makes me think of the uh, the horse, bef- the cart before the horse. You know what I mean? Like there's other things that need to be established in the DC. Let's say. Because I don't even know, is this going to be on the WB? It looks like the person from Warner Brothers is talk, talking about it. And it does look like it's going to be amongst, it's, it's, made, it's um, going to be developed by Jeff Johns and Greg Ber- Berlanti, who takes care of all of the CW superhero shows like Flash and right. Legends of Tomorrow. So right. it looks like it's going to tie into that universe. But my question is, how can you have a Teen Titans show when Robin's not? An existing character in these in this universe yet. Batman's not mentioned in this universe yet. There's certain things you have to establish before jumping into a cast of characters that uh, wouldn't exist without that character. You know what I mean? You can't you can't have Robin on the Teen Titans and, and dance around Batman. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of the, the cart before the horse. So well, maybe 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 this takes place in two different timelines. But then that muddies the waters because why would you have two different, uh, two different universes on not, a not CW th- show? Not not two Our different timelines. Uni- yeah, not timelines? two different universes. Just two different. All right, just say uh, whatever show takes place several years before the mm-hmm. Teen Titans show. Like if you try to cut tie it into Gotham, we can say that the Gotham show took place years and years before this Teen Titans live action. Right. So I don't see what the, that problem is. My whole issue is that uh, the Flash is garbage. Uh, mm-hmm. The Arrow is not good. Mm-hmm. Um, Strong opinions. Strong opinions. I like the Flash. I don't the like Flash, Arrow. Look, look, the Flash is better out of all of those. The Flash, yeah, Flash is probably is the, the best, best out of all of The best out of all of them. However, it's nothing, it's, it's nothing that I will go brag about. I mean, it's what you got, dude. That's exactly, I mean. exactly. So it's when you, you say got, that, man. when you say that, I mean, look, personally, the Flash, the Flash series is better than anything that's been produced by DC. I would say live action in the last 10, twenty years. You're absolutely right. But what is that saying? Yeah, the bar is very the bar is, low. The bar is very low. <laughs> so you, have, you ain't got to do much. You ain't got to do much to uh, to look, write that train. That right? guy who plays Cisco on the Flash. Yeah. Cisco, you can't do it. I can't take him. Yeah, man, I feel you, dude. Like, I can't take Mr. Terrific on Arrow. I can't take I him. I can't man. even, I couldn't even get past I, the first episode uh, of Arrow. Mr. Terrific, 
Like, he's just a weird actor, man. I just can't. He doesn't, Mr. Terrific is like the stoic, kind of super genius, kind of cocky, kind of, in the comics. And this guy is over here getting socked out by muggers wearing a full suit. He has, he has the whole suit, first of all. He has the entire t- Mr. Terrific regalia. And he's getting punched out by muggers because he don't know how to fight yet. It's like the worst. It's, but anyway. But yeah, I have high hopes for this. We'll see. It's one of those we'll see. So, well, I don't know. Yeah. As long as it looks good and as long as they have uh, Beast Boy in it, I don't really care. Beast well, she much. looks good. She yeah. looks good. And, and Starfire is an attractive girl in, in all mediums. So we'll see how she does. I wonder if they're going to put her in orange or they're just going to keep her African keep her with African American shade. I'm curious about that. Ah, uh, we'll see. I don't, I don't know. know. We'll see. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, guys. Time for Mike's favorite news. Oh, jeez. Injustice 2. Let's go. Fighter pack includes Black Manta. Black Manta. A Manta. Bro. Excuse Black me. Manta, Raiden bro. and Hellboy. So Black Manta. Raiden. If I'm not mistaken, that's that guy from the DC universe. Right? Yes, he's um a villain that goes after Batman. No, uh, Aquaman. Aquaman. Yeah. We know about Hellboy, but Raiden. Raiden. How do you feel about Raiden, dude? It's about time he got some respect. Raiden is... That's a weird pick. It's a weird pick because he's not... He doesn't scream guest character. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, that's good. Sub-Zero, I like Scorpion. It. Yeah, but that's been, that's been done. That's been done. That's um, been done. I know a lot of people are salty because they're like, well, another DC character could have gotten that spot. And I'm like, like who? I'm like... One, we're already running the ring pretty thin already, right? Who's going to put in their elongated man? Uh, right. I mean, crazy quilt, you know what I'm saying? Calendar they, man. Especially since the Mortal Kombat character was there the last game. So, I mean, and two, you got to save some characters for Justice 3. You can't put all the bomb ones in and squeeze them in this one. You know what I'm saying? There has to be the, the, the trick of the fighting game that reels in new, new players or casuals, as they call them is the excitement of the roster. Roster is extremely important in fighting games. Unless you're a Mugen fan. Well, Mugen is infinite roster. We don't, we don't talk about Mugen on this podcast. All right, man. I, I fell That's down a deep Mugen hole, and I lost all my data. I had a 600-character Mugen build. Oh, so glorious. So that was a long time ago, because now they're talking about 5,000 characters. Crazy, right? Do you want Salty Bet? No. Do you know what Salty Bet is? No, I don't. It's where they pit the Mugen characters against each other with AI and people bet on it. Oh. It's the coolest thing in the world. Like, wow. It's, it's so whack. It's, I, I'm going to show you some Salty Bet before we leave. That's it. That sounds fun. So, Hellboy, I wish it was Spawn. I think everybody wishes that was Spawn because Spawn was, uh, was um, teased to be in the game. Mm-hmm. But maybe there's another. We have a whole other fighter pack coming out soon. You know what I'm saying? After this one. After all these characters get run through. Right. And uh, Black Manta's um, gameplay was showed off like today. Hot news. And he looks pretty good. He, he looks like a rushdown character with flight capability and laser eyes. So he fits right in, right? Right. So I'm pretty hyped. Uh, I would say if I had to rank these characters in excitement, I would go Hellboy, Raiden, because I'm very curious to see what they do with him, and Black Manta. And, and characters I'm excited to see what can actually do. The only reason Black Manta's lower on that list because I just saw him today, and I know what he can do. But so between Raiden and Hellboy, I'm more curious about Raiden. I wonder how they're going to approach him um, in this system, and if he's going to be like a, a teleporting, keep away character like he is in regular, you know, Mortal Kombat games, or you know, we'll see how it goes. I'm very. They're going to do it the same way they did Sub I mean, Scorpion. Right. They're going to keep him pretty. If you played him in uh, MKX. You're probably comfortable playing them here with a couple of new things, right? Right. Just you got to get used to the jugglers that the that that um that that uh, what is the Justice League system has? Yeah, the injustice system. Uh, right. Where injustice. it's a lot of air juggling and combos right. off walls and stuff. So whereas Mortal Kombat is more hand combos. Yeah, it's more it's more technical. Yeah, and it's yeah. A, it's a lot and, and moves less, those moves. Mm-hmm. And, Finished fatality. It's, it's hard. It's a harder game than me. Like to play Mortal Kombat, it's more difficult to play that than Injustice. Injustice seems a little easier to pull off moves and to, to get free free damage and stuff like that. Well, how do you how do you how do you like the Street Fighter Five official 
Yeah. How do you say her name? Minot. 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 Yeah. She looks interesting. Reveal. Did you did you watch it? Yeah, I watched it. What do you she think has... of the character? It's a, it's a little interesting little. She's she's unique. She reminds me of Rose from Street Fighter Alpha. Remember Rose? The one, Vaguely, I remember the one the that name. could do that air grab. Yeah, she was like a female in Bison type. Yeah, thing. kind of right. She reminds me of Rose. I mean, I've been turned off of Street Fighter Five since they haven't announced Blanca. I'm like I'm boycotting that game until my boy's in it. That's just me. I hate to be that guy, but there's literally no one on this team. There's no one in the entire game I want to I want to play as, and that's and that's saying something because I'm not really into show those like Ryu and Ken. They did my boy Vega weird. I can't play as Vega anymore. He's a he's a he's not a charge character anymore. He's a, he's a command character now. What does that mean? So pretty much um, in fighting games, there's two different types of characters. There's charge characters where you hold the back button for one or two seconds, and you press forward and tap an attack like like. Uh, Guile Sonic Boom, for example, right. are and Bison Cycle Crusher, and then there's characters who have commands like Ken and Ryu, like Ken and Ryu, where you would push down, down forward, forward punch, which is a classic Hadouken. So gotcha. for years, Vega has been a charge character since the game's creation. But in Street Fighter Five, they decided to change a lot of his moves to be command char- to command uh, layout. So it just feels funky playing as that character, and it's just it's very unattractive unappealing to me. So I just can't get into the game. I, right. Until my boy Blanca, and if they make Blanca a command character, I'm just going to throw that game out my window. Okay, so how do you feel about this game? The Yakuza? Uh, Kawaii? Kawaii 2, yep. It's not really the Yakuza that really excites me. It's that the, the guys who are make, who make Yakuza games are making a Fist of the North Star game. You remember Fist uh, of the North yeah, Star? Yeah, I was going to get into that. Yeah. So you don't care about the first one. Nah, I don't care about. I okay, don't, so I don't the really Fist play of the North Star. We can skip that because yeah, I never played it. Right. But the Fist of the North Star game looks awesome, <laughs> right? This is <laughs> like flat out, right? Like, yeah, it just it looks is, great, right? It looks awesome. I want to play it right now. Yeah, I, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing it right now because I have to watch it. And I advise all you guys out there, if you listen to the podcast. Uh, get Fist of the North Star and watch it right now. It's one of the best animes of all time. <laughs> it's up there. Well, watch the game trailer. Watch the, the game, game trailer awesome and then watch the anime. Right. Even, even if you've seen it before, there's no bad time to watch there's, Fist of the there's North Star. There's a series of Fist of the North Star, too. Yeah, there's a couple of different series. That, that's been remade a few times. But the good thing about this game is they said that um, they're going to uh, put totally different stories in here. Mm. It's not going to be the same story from the movie. That's interesting. The TV show is going right. to be the well, same characters but different stories. So That's it fine. A more make it make it more interesting because it's like Dragon Ball games. It's like how many times can you tell the Cell games, right? Right. You got to shake things up a little bit. So I'm down for that. I'm just cu- I just want to play as uh, you know Kenshiro, punch someone's brain open. Uh, I was interested to see if they had Raul the Conqueror here. Raul and Raul's horse. Nothing's more godlike than Raul's horse, dude. Raul's horse is the best yeah. ever. I didn't make it to the end of the video. That's all right. I'm going to do it now. Yeah, um, man. I watched it the first time. Um, yeah, Fist of the North Star is one of those. It looks like they have, uh, you know how they had in the TV show those humongous individuals? Yeah, for no for no reason. Yeah. The super the super giants. They have this here, too. Uh, that's awesome. So it's like that one scene where the girl is about to get stepped on by that giant giant. Yeah. It was a, it's a giant that's giant. Pretty much the entire girl fits under his boot. It's so silly. And then Kinshiro like comes through like a giant. He comes through a city. He pretty much crashes down the city to stop this fight from miles away. Kinshiro's yeah. the coolest, man. I don't care. They have the head explosions. Nice. It, it needs to be gory because I remember Fist of the North Star being it, super gory. It is. Yeah. That's, it's not overdoing it, though. That, well, it's just fine. I mean, as long as, as long as it's anime accurate, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it don't need to be all splatter house on us but uh i think i'm really hyped for that game and, and there the is games no showing of raul the conqueror maybe they're also. holding them this is a this is a debut trailer you okay know what I'm so we'll stay tuned on that that's definitely going to be in the docket if anything pops up you know, you yeah, know what that's, I'm saying? that's very important absolutely also in other news what's very important is the overwatch they changed two players so mm-hmm. The creator of Overwatch, what's his name, Jeff Kaplan? Yeah, he's, he's not the creator. He's kind of like the development head or something like that, right? Right, I stand corrected. No, no worries. So he, he they're, they're changing two characters. to play really drastically. Characters. 
Yeah. One character, Mercy, mm-hmm. and another character, D Boss. So D-Boss. Mercy looks like she'll be able to fly and yep. high, extremely powered up. Yeah. So I don't know why anybody else would pick anybody other than her. I've seen her play now. They have this thing called PTR, mm-hmm. where it's a um, it's a way that uh, uh, people can you know play play the game before these actual things are set up. Um, so it's kind of like a beta where you can you know test out the game. This is a way for game developers to test the online. Make sure that connections are working right, and to see if the character is not broken in, in a physical way. So, pretty much the buffs in that uh, Mercy is getting uh, is uh, she's getting flight, of course. Um, she's getting kind of infinite flight, actually, not infinite, but it is on a timer, and she's becoming just more viable, uh, viable. Uh, uh, combat wise because she was actually just a healer she was actually just more of a healer and uh, that was pretty much her function this but is diva this is a uh, mercy mercy um, she was just she you know you know how it goes in MMORPGs there's there's tank classes right. there's um, DPS defense and um, and pretty much the heal squad but now she's pretty much just like a flying Valkyrie going around wiping out whole teams by herself and that's totally not what the character was. So you're, they pretty much rebuilt the character from the ground up. Why was she? Why was she powered up and Diva powered down? Because Diva was a bit over. Well, Diva got caught, Diva was powered down like on health. I think I can. I may be wrong, but uh, she was powered up because she gained a new attack, which is like a rocket barrage. I saw that played on Twitch the other night by one of my uh, favorite uh, YouTube stre- um, e- um, online streamers, uh, Moon Moon. Give him a shout out. Um, you haven't seen Moon Moon on Twitch. Check him out. He's a funny guy. He doesn't take no crap from anyone. Yeah. So I watched him play the new PTR with these characters in action. And to me, I play a lot of Overwatch. Uh, my main, just for those who are going to be curious right now, is Hanzo. I'm a Hanzo main. Don't don't yell at me too loud. But for tanks, I'm also a D.Va main myself. So I'm kind of curious to see how D.Va plays and how different she's going to be. Because that's one of the main characters. But my favorite character... Is Zarya, and she's like a super tank, uh, kind of absor- um, energy absorption character. And she's my absolute favorite, actually. But I've been, but the game is built in a way. If you haven't played it, Bradley, it's like the game kind of without forcing you makes you want to try other characters. You're constantly ch- switching who your favorite character is because each character is so unique, and each one is different for a different kind of battle strategy. So. It just depends on what you feel like that night. Some nights I may play uh, a diva, or some nights I might play Mercy. I'm gonna play a lot more in Mercy now that now that she's a killing machine. You know what I mean? So right. I definitely have to see how that feels <clears throat> once it's actually live and they tweaked it all. You know. And last but not least, last but not least, we have here um, in honor of Jack Kirby's 100th birthday today. Um, I would like to, well, we just think it'd be fun if we look at some of these questions, these, these notable, uh, uh, you know, uh, tidbits about, uh, Jack Kirby's life. So on CBR.com, they have some Jack Kirby, the legend revealed little, uh, um, questions you can you can entertain uh, one for example uh, did Johnny Carson give an on air apology to Jack Kirby on a Tonight Show I didn't after know that. accidentally <laughs> insulting him earlier on the show you can follow that link and get more details about that question and there's 20 of them which is which is cool yeah uh, number 18 did Jack Kirby and Stan Lee each appear as models on comic book covers, I know. Stan I, I'm Lee. sure that happened. I'm 100 percent sure that happened. Absolutely, because uh, people do that now. I mean, like uh, Stan was kind of a skinny dude back in the day. Okay, so I'm a, let's put let's put Mike to the test. See, I'm not even gonna know a lot of this stuff. But if you the wanna, Johnny Carson, one, we can skip that. Yeah. Uh, did Jack Kirby intend for his fourth world saga to end with both Dark Side and Orion dead? I don't think so. I don't think that was his original intent. Because why would you continue? Why would you build up characters to um, to, to kill them? But then 
comic book deaths are always um, short lived. Short lived. So I would say no, but that okay. would be my answer. How about uh, let me try one more? That was a good yeah, one. Yeah, one more. Did Jack Kirby use the first double page splash in a comic book story? I don't think so. Because I could have sworn a double page, like a splash page, right? Uh, you know what? He may have done it with uh, his early Fantastic, Fantastic Four. Four. Exactly. So I'm thinking he may have done it with his early Fantastic Four work, or maybe a lot of his fourth world work. You know what I'm saying? So um, Jack Kirby, I just wanted to kind of mention this on on the show um, because you know just what Jack Kirby has meant to comic book fans and how influential he's been. You know what I mean? Jack Kirby created so many of the heroes that we see every day, like Captain America. He, I think he co helped he co created Captain America. He created so many Marvel characters. I believe the Hulk, the Fantastic Four. I want to say. Iron Man, I want to say so. Uh, it definitely he's and a lot of DC characters too. So it's it's like the um, all of the um, New Genesis characters, um, like uh, Orion. You mentioned Dark Side, uh, my favorite Mister Miracle. So definitely want to give a shout out to Jack. It's his hundredth birthday. It was yesterday, so I wanted to acknowledge him and talk about him a little bit on the podcast and see if um, and see if uh, what your thoughts about. The, the king was. Oh, he's the king. Um, That's what they call him. Yeah, it's you know? cool. Is he, did he pass? He passed a while ago. This would have been his 100th birthday yesterday. Oh, okay, would have been. All right, yeah, man. Um, you know. Excellent, man. Uh, contributed a lot. You know, I read a lot of his materials. I'll be going through a couple, a couple of those questions, trying to get more information. Right. But, um, yeah, I'm glad we brought it up on the show. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to take a time to talk about Hurricane Harvey. Well, we definitely want to acknowledge what's going on with Harvey. Uh, well, I wanted to kind of wait until the end of the show to kind of acknowledge it. But we can talk about it right now. You know, I just want to give a quick um, shout out to those who are going through that. And um, my prayers are out to them. A lot of comic book fans out there and a lot of people who are, who are losing their houses and losing their lives during this great American tragedy. And uh, just on a side note, it's kind of funny how social media is kind of uh, put putting the spurs to certain people to give. These people are in, who are positions, positions to give. Like there is this thing going on with um, Joel Olstein. He's a pastor who refused to... Uh, open his uh, his church to the people who were dying the people who were in in the water like trying to find shelter and where do you go when you try to find shelter is the, is the church the holy church and he and his church seats like 15,000 people something crazy like that and he would not open his doors he, he, he would leave them out he locked them out and it became a huge thing on social media and people were asking him why you know, why would you do this? You know, you have a, you're in a position to help people and get them out the water. And it, there was an, a drop in his entire church. He made an excuse. But later, he felt the heat of his actions and actually opened the church the, the, day, the next day after the backlash. Right. So but let's give a shout out for all those people who are out there helping, sacrificing their did lives. Did you hear about those, those um, celebrities that actually are giving a lot of money? <laughs> like... Um, uh, uh, the the Rock gave a lot of money. Uh, Floyd Mayweather gave a hundred million dollars. Absolutely, he's at, he's he's out there handing out turkeys and water like Nino Brown. It's awesome. Uh, I know um, the Rock gave some money. Sandra Bullock gave some money. So the Bullock, huh? The Bullock, Doug. She so was it looks neck, like dude. Hurricane Harvey is in the Houston, Texas area, on its way to Louisiana. Yes. Hurricane Harbor. Harvey. Oh yeah, Hurricane Harvey. Yeah, it's traveling. It's uh, but I hear it's on its last leg. So hopefully. It's just to be a time for of, of for um, rebuilding. And I just want to just give a quick shout out and acknowledgement of that going on. Um, the Masters of the Nerdiverse podcast is it's a, it's a lighthearted show. We talk about comics and things that are kind of like life distractions, but sometimes you do need to acknowledge these things and just spread the word. And you know, if you can help, there's plenty of sites out there that you can donate to and kind of you know give your little helping hand because every little bit counts. Um, we're just as a note of reference we're based out of LA so you know we're going to be doing what we can from here to really make a difference so uh, thank you Bradley for mentioning that um, good so good news good news oh, good business 
Good business. Absolutely. Good business. So now we're going to go into our questions, questions and answers. And just to let you know, if you'd like to send a question in for me and Bradley to answer and give our two, three, 35 cents, you can send those to masters of the nerdiverse cast at gmail.com. And you may say, Mike, um, I just got attacked by an adulkin in my chest and I didn't hear you through the wind of the attack. Can you repeat that? Sure, it's Masters of the Nerdiverse Cast at gmail.com. So, would you like me to read the questions, Bradley, or would you like to read them tomorrow? All righty, I'll go through the questions. So, I'm going to ask you, Mike, if you were to move one character from any game to another franchise, what would it be? Absolutely. Uh, I haven't even thought of this question. I wrote it down. I didn't even think about it. But... If um and that's and that's more really seen in fighting games. Very recently, Geese Howard from the Ki- from the King of Fighters series is in Tekken now, which is going to make me buy the game. So that's an example of a character from another franchise going to another one. But if I had to take a franchise character and put him into another game, I would take. I want to say something just came to mind. I would take Dante from the Devil May Cry series and put him in a Resident Evil game. Just make it and make it crazy, and just make it and just make it uh, out of control. You know, Resident Evil is supposed to be like more of a horror set, horror setting. Devil yeah. May Cry is a very horror based game in its in its narration, not in its gameplay, mind you, because it's a very fast paced action shoot 'em up. But I think it would be interesting to put Dante in a narration where he can't just run around destroying all these creatures. He actually has to crawl through through castles and. You know what I mean, and go through this, go through the motions of feeling that sense of tension, like a, a Devil May Cry game directed by the makers of Resident Evil. Would just be kind of so different. I think it would be so weird to put that character in that position and kind of see where things would go, and to elaborate on a storyline in a more comprehensible fashion, having to be go through a slower pace and build tension. So I think that's where I would throw. I would throw uh, Dante right in the middle of Raccoon City and let and see how he deals with, see how he would approach it. Right, I I, I feel that, you know, what I, and I agree with the the fighting game um, thing, but I think it can you can take other characters like from third person shooters mm-hmm. and put them in another third person shooter. So I think it's like it's it go it's it's based on genre to genre. Right. Um, so I would say if I had to do do a fighting game. I would want to put Ryu in any fight game. Right. He's fits, right? Akuma. Or Akuma. Akuma's in uh, Tekken, dude. Yeah, just any fighting game. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, and then if we looked at a first-person shooter, right. got to get Snake. Snake. Put Snake in any first-person shooter. No, not a first-person. I'm in a third-person. Third-person. So, like, what, Splinter Cell? Splinter Cell. Put him in uh, Hitman. Put, put Snake in Gears of War. Yeah, <laughs> just throw them in there. Yeah, why not? Uh, you know, and then um, you know, first person shooter doesn't really work. You just see the, the yeah. The, it would have to be like a mechanic. You know, mm-hmm. what I'm saying like an Overwatch character in a Call of Duty would be would break it because you just imagine we just talked about uh, Mercy flying across the right yeah. and, and, and reviving characters and shooting people, and that's not going to work in a in a mili- in a World War II setting. No. You know what I'm saying? So I, I say break the game or use it as a tool to elaborate on a character that doesn't get really a time to rest and uh, and fill out that character's uh, that character's uh, plot line. That's what All I would right. do. Okay, so what is your favorite video game theme music? Shoot, dude, that's you know what? It's funny. I already know what my answer is, and it's real easy. And it's been my it was my ringtone all last year. And it's um, go, um, go straight. It's the main theme music of Streets of Rage from the Sega Genesis. It was the, it was Sega Genesis notoriously had a better sound chip than the Super Nintendo had. And the Streets of Rage game was one of the first games where it was like a jazzy kind of. It didn't sound like Mario two bit, you know, notes. It was like it was an orchestration. Okay. And one of the one of the soundtracks that really stuck with me as a kid was that opening theme to. Uh, Streets of Rage that that I would do it, but I don't want to beatbox right yeah, now. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. I can't. No. But if you ever get a chance, look up the opening for Streets of Rage. Um, Go straight. It's a classic 
jazzy kind of saxy kind of song and it's just it's perfect to me it's one of my favorites mm, okay i would have to say tetris for the game boy <laughs> you can't go wrong i can't argue that i do not that's amazing what's more what's, what's more iconic than in tetris you know what i mean like did you like the b-side though the yeah B-side i like i like all the music on Te- yeah. tetris game boy that's man that takes me back i remember getting my first game boy and wrecking it as a kid my mom was so heated I like put poster paint on the screen. I was such a brat back then. But I played a lot of Tetris. And I played a lot of Super Mario World on the uh, Game Boy. And that Tetris thing, it's up there with the Mario chime and the Zelda music. You know what I mean? It's like, it's too iconic. Right. Another Nintendo property, you know? So it's like, can't argue with that. I'm down for that. How about, what's a redesign of a character you like? Oh, good question. Uh, I'm just going to shoot out a couple that come to mind. Um, even though the game is horrible, I like Dante. I'm going to keep I love Devil May Cry. Uh, Dante's um, suit in Devil May Cry 2, I think it was his best design. Beating out three, fight me. Uh, Kyo Kusanagi in King of Fighters. His white outfit when he changed from his school suit. Uh, the black Spider-Man um, symbiote suit is a cool character design switch. Uh, Chun-Li's uh, Tracksuit and Street Fighter Alpha. It's a good design. Switch. Uh, Wolverine's um, brown outfit from his yellow and gold. Or yellow, yellow, yellow and blue from the 60s X, 70s X-Men, the John Byrne run. And that's just a quick fire of a couple of that a costume uh, redesigns that I really dig. And I draw when I can. Any that come to your mind, brother? Oh man, you know what? I I I look at a lot of art. Uh, what is it? The website Deviant Art. Yeah, I'm on there. Absolutely. And uh, there's so many redesigns and mm-hmm. things Makes like your head that. Spin, won't it? Yeah, I can't even begin to name uh, some of the things I saw. But I'm not really into the redesigns as as much as I am into the initial design of characters. Mm. Okay. Um, I see what you mean. Like, uh, I'm, oh, I'm reading the book now, um, The Ruler 2, with, uh, it's it's about Darth Bane. And, oh, okay, uh, yeah. The Sith book, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And um, I like how some characters design him with the obelisk on him, looking like Ryan Reynolds. That was cool. It was yeah. a CGI thing. Um. But let me think of a, of a redesign. A redesign. Help me out with that. What, what okay, I'm going to name out some funky redesigns. You tell me if you liked it or not, and see if you remember. Because we used to we used to walk up to the comic book store back in the day and pick up these horrible '90s uh, redesigns. So I'm going to name five of them. Uh, Batman 500, the Azrael Batman suit, where it's all it's all mechanized and he has claws and he doesn't have a no. mouth. Okay. Okay. Another redesign. Uh, Cyclops. The the, uh, the switch from his old school um, initial X Men suit to the '90s blue and yellow uh, cartoon version of his suit. That's a, that's a redesign. Uh, if it comes to mind, the, uh, the the they're they're both pretty lame. <laughs> I I hate you right now. I Cyclops don't like the, the tights. Best. It's a super t- heroes wear tights. Not all of them. Like the Punisher, he wears tights. They, yeah, there's there more heroes time, than not there, that wear that don't wear yeah, tights. You're right. There was a time when everybody had the tights on. Yeah, man, it's a superhero thing. You can get around it. You can't get around it. You have to. You have to confront it. But uh, yeah, superhero. Um, it doesn't have to be superhero redesigns. It could be jersey redesigns. Like, what's your favorite redesign of a basketball jersey? I'm just curious. Well, when they made the Laker jerseys black, because that purple and gold is garbage. <laughs> um, you know you're going to piss off some Laker fans, the right? They made the Clippers jerseys black, because I don't like the red, white, and blue. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not a jersey guy either. No, no, jersey right, let's, guy? let's keep it to... Uh, keep it to comics, keep it to video games, keep comic, it to movies. video games, and okay. movies. Sure. Okay, let's just go to movies. The redesign of a, of a movie character from either a book or a comic book Fair to an actual screen. Okay, that's a, that's good. Okay, so what's your favorite um, comic to movie, movie adaptation suit, as it were? 
or design. Kind of like X Men to the X Men film where they were the black leather. Yeah, that was terrible. That was, that was terrible. I think they got Silver Surfer. Silver Surfer was a redesign. He, he was, was just a, like it was Silver Surfer. It was like um, was, <laughs> there was no design to it. Redesign was awesome. I think I think Captain America's redesign and yeah. and, uh, and Winter Soldier was a huge boost to what it looked like in Avengers. Right. Yeah. Uh, they really Winter sl- Soldier and Captain America's suits were. Were totally better because remember in the comic book he had those boots that were kind of bell bottom. Yeah, he had the, uh, the the Patriots boots. That wasn't gonna work. Nah, nah, not in this day and age. Matter of fact, all of all of the Avenger characters uh, look great actually. Yeah, <laughs> on, on screen. Yeah, they, they, they figured it out. Their suits was not going to work. Man, and Captain America still wears those boots in the comics to this day, dude. Those like those like those Puritan boots. Yeah, man, those are the caps. But yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Caps, man. Marvel does a really good job with their with their comic book to live action adaptation suits. Even Daredevils, it's pretty good based on what they were, were working with. You know what I mean? Right. It Absolutely. still looks good. You know, it's just like uh, Spider Man suit in Homecoming looks good. Looks different. You know what I mean? Uh, go even Ghost Rider. Did you watch Ghost Rider when he was on Agents of Shield? He looked good. You know, for for their budget. So I mean, like. Marvel kind of has it locked down. DC, on the other hand, man, struggling, huh? struggling. I just want them to be good. I want them. I want it to be cool. Let's move on. Let's move on. This All breaks right. my heart. So, good questions. Very good questions. We reached that time in the show where we're going to start going into our closings. Uh, I guess I'll go through what, what I'm looking forward to this coming week. Uh, definitely looking forward to playing more Kingdom Hearts. I'm literally in the, in purgatory with that game. I have to finish it. I'm just, that's just in my personality. I'm still getting hype for Uncharted Lost Legacy. I haven't had a chance to purchase it yet. I do want to play that. I'm getting hype about uh, finishing Death Note. Uh, I wanted to see that whole story and kind of really fairly base that on the film. I'm definitely doing more artwork. I'm probably going to work on the artwork for this show tomorrow. And it'll be ready by tomorrow. And... Definitely still in the process of figuring out some more content for you guys. Um, going to be doing some movie reviews soon as a as a separate um, as a, as a separate content. I'm going to be going around asking all my friends, family to review their favorite movie with me, and we're going to go through and, re- and review their movies and have their experiences with that film and kind of take it from there. So it's kind of an idea I just came up. I came up with maybe like last week. I'm probably going to start. With me, my friend, doing Monster Squad. Never watched it before. It's one of her favorite movies, so we are kind of interested to see that. And uh, my father wants to do RoboCop, so I'm kind of curious to see how that's going to go. You are you going to be with your father? Yeah, gonna... it's, we're, we're both going to talk about it. And where is he going to be at? Um, we're going to be on Skype. We're just oh, going to Skype it up. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're going to figure it out. Tell him I said what's up. Yeah, you know my pops. He lives in Chicago now. So oh, sorry to hear that. I know, right? Yikes. Uh, but at least he gets some decent pizza. So um, definitely going to Skype with him. And we, me and Bradley have been talking about a film we want to do. We're not going to mention it yet. But it's probably going to be horrible. So I'm going to make Bradley watch. And he's going to not be happy. Samurai Cop. Samurai Cop's the best. Shut up. We're going to watch. You've seen it? Yeah. I, I love Samurai Cop. You, have you seen it? Unfortunately, I have. Remember the part where the, that giant ceramic lion head was in the shot and it kept like focusing on it? I didn't. I didn't understand anything I was doing in that movie. <laughs> Remember Samurai Cop's speech in front of them, in front of that table? And he they just said, kept going, he kept the, going deep into it. They the, were just staring at him. The reason why they said, uh, the reason why I watched it, because <laughs> it was it's worst, quoted as dude. the worst movie ever. It's pretty bad. And you, uh, you know what we should watch? We should watch The Room. You know, we. I've you know, never seen The Room. I would love to do The I Room. I saw The Room. Yeah, I heard it's extremely horrible. I was subjected. That's the one where it's <laughs> all subjected. red and black. No, that's the one with the, I did not hit her. I did not. No, the room is like oh, everything is red and black. And then like people just randomly die in the room. They got to figure out why people are dying. No, you're thinking about the cube. Well, that's the cube. The room is a really horrible love story directed by this madman of a film director. And, he, and it's the worst. It's the, they say it's the most poorly directed film of all time. 
Worse than Samurai Cop. It's worse than worse than Planet Nine of Outer Space. Just is hot, hot it's just god awful. So I want to watch. I don't know if we should do the room because you you haven't seen that one. I haven't seen it. I think it would be an experience. So we're gonna work on that. I'm really excited about that. Um, you looking forward to anything this week, Bradley man? I'm gonna finish this book and I'm gonna pick up Frank Herbert's Dune. Oh, that's that's gonna be a, a yeah, big bite, man. They Yikes. said that that book has a dictionary that accompanies accompanies it. You have to learn another language, bro. You're absolutely right. And Frank Herbert <laughs> got the Nebula Award for that book. So. Dude, you got to tell me about that. It's like it's it's one of those where it's like my friends like read Preacher, right? And it's like Preacher is this really good dark horse book. I believe it's dark horse, and really? it's and it's a text. It's a huge. Giant story. Preacher's good. Preacher's extremely I good. I pass by it so many times when I'm in the library. Pick up Preacher, dude. Preacher you ready? is. I, I people that I respect their opinion have told me it's one of the best books ever. It's just very dense. It's like Watchmen. It's like very a very dense story, and it's a lot. So you're you're pretty much taking on a lot of reading. When you is read. it what what type of story is it? Well, pretty much the story of Preacher, from my understand, from my rudimentary understanding. Is that preacher is a character that has the voice of God? Is he's bestowed with an ability that allows him to whatever he says or whatever he says, something someone's going to do, it will happen All one right. way or another. If I have the ability of the voice of God, I say Bradley, you can go to hell. You will literally go to hell. Or I say Bradley, you know, I don't want to be vulgar, but if, you know, Bradley, go fuck yourself. You're definitely going to go try to do that. You know what I'm saying? Like and, and, and accomplish it, mm-hmm. even, even if it means the end of your life. So, the story is pretty much about him and this new power, his girlfriend, and a traveling vampire go across country avoiding actual heaven trying to get the voice back. Because it's something that mortals are not supposed to have, obviously. So, it's pretty much like a, uh, from what I understand, it's a road a road uh, series that pretty much goes ups and downs and turns around and it's supposed to be one of the best things since sliced bread. So, okay. That, and if you haven't read Why the Last Man, read that as well. Just do it. Or, or for that matter, my favorite short, my favorite graphic novel set of all time is Planetary. That's written by Warren Ellis and art by John Cassidy. And it's actually one of my favorite comic book anything of all time. It's like my third favorite graphic novel. Second. It's just very well read. I don't want to give anything away because it's, even the description is kind of spoilery, but it's a ride and I would recommend anyone to read that. Um, so I'm very curious to see how you handle Dune. I mean, that's, that's kind of an intimidating adventure there, but nothing to it but to do it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this comes to the end of our podcast. Definitely excited for next week. I think we had a good show this week. A lot of, um, a lot of good uh, content. So a little laughs there. So always remember to like, comment, and subscribe on my Twitter handle, which is mnerdiverse. Once again, that's mnerdiverse. Spelled how it sounds, ladies and gentlemen. I have been your host, Mike G. And of course, my co-host, Bradley. And we're signing off. Always ask you to go that one step beyond. Mm-hmm.